Hello, and in this video, what I wanna do is I want to give you guys an overview of my electrical trainer build. I'm gonna go ahead and actually give you an overview of the trainer and what it is. Now, the first question you might have is, what is an electrical trainer? Now, there's multiple styles of electrical trainers out there. I am getting ready to start a series on motor controls and a series of videos on PLCs. So, my electrical trainers are usually based around an electrical cabinet that you might find inside of a manufacturing plant. It's basically DIN rail with wire strips, or runway, I'm sorry, all the way around it, and so that way you can mount up all of your different components, and then you can wire them together, or you can wire them together, and then you can program your PLCs, you can make things, you know, you can have outputs, you can have motors, you can have all sorts of different stuff, and it's usually clipped up onto one board, very easy to get to. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, who would be interested in a video like this, or who would be interested in building a trainer? Well, ultimately, any uh, technical teacher out there that teaches automation or mechatronics or something like that would probably want to build a trainer like this. There are a bunch of different styles, which I'll go over in just a second. If you're a student, I would say if you could uh, scrape together a little bit of money, probably about 200 to 300 bucks, you could build a trainer uh, a little bit more simple than this one per se, but you could build a trainer and be able to actually practice all of the different circuits that you might have. A technical trainer or an industrial trainer where you're actually flying around teaching stuff, uh, so a trainer like this would go a long way where you could actually go ahead and teach some of those kind of things. And then finally, maybe like a maintenance manager or something like that. If you wanted to build a trainer and actually have it in your maintenance department to help build uh, your maintenance team, it'd be a super smart idea. Uh, and honestly, even just my viewers that are watching this here on YouTube, if you are interested in learning motor controls and you don't have the ability to go to a college class, ultimately build yourself a trainer, 100 to 300 bucks, you probably could do almost every different project out there. You could even buy a textbook and self-teach yourself. Now, second question, why would you want to build one over buying one? Ultimately, buying them, are, they're extremely expensive. You're usually going to spend around 1500 to three grand, and if it's going to have a PLC on it, it's going to be even more than that. So I'm building this one. This one was about 700 bucks. I'm going to go ahead and give you the overview here in a second. And, but you could honestly build it much cheaper than me, probably 250 to 300 dollars. Uh, all of my components are bought from Automation Direct. If you go, if you just like quickly Google or what, search their website, you can see that all of their componentry is super cheap, and then you can kind of buy as you need and stuff like that. The other thing, if you build your own trainer, it's a lot easier to upgrade things or change things for your curriculum as you're going along. Say five years down the road, you no longer can buy a certain Allen Bradley PLC. Well, now you can switch a whole classroom full of trainers very easily, which I mean, that one's not like super hard to do, but ultimately if you wanted to, maybe you want to start teaching motion controls and you needed an extra place on a board, most of the time, some of the ones you'd buy are typically hard mounted and stuff like that. You couldn't add on to them very easily. So flexibility and costs are pretty much the main reason you would want to build your own. So let's go ahead. I'm going to quickly give you an overview of the actual trainer itself. Okay. So let's go ahead and we'll start on the left and work our way over. First thing I went ahead and I have a extension cord or I put a cord on it. That's just 120 volts. I could easily do 220 volts. I could even probably go and put high voltage in this thing and have like 480 volts, but most of the time you don't have that in a classroom and it's just a lot safer to work with 120 volts and a lot easier. So I went ahead, I got a cord. It comes up here to a power disconnect. I always put a power disconnect on here. So that way, if I ever want to teach lockout tag out or um, anything like that, some, some more of a safety style type thing, I have that ability. While at the same time, when I'm working on this, I have one location that I can turn off all the power. Super easy just to disconnect it. Um, it's just kind of, it just makes life a lot easier. These disconnects are not cheap. I would say this one was like $70 and I think some of them are around like 150 to $200. So um, definitely something you'd have to think about if you decide to do that. It's basically the power is running straight through. Now on other trainers that I have built for students, I did put a, a fuse in here. I'm sorry, not a fuse, a breaker. I just put a one amp breaker in here and it saved me a lot of my transformers because a lot of times students will wire the transformers to a direct ground and then boom, it's done for. But if you put a little one amp breaker in here before it actually even goes into the uh, transformer, it seems to save a lot of those. So 
because accidents happen. Uh, so after that, I just have the wire come out into my distribution block. The distribution block is a little bit more expensive to put on a trainer. I think this one was like 50 bucks. Um, but all it does is give me the ability to have my high voltage side or a representation of the high voltage side. Like I said, it's just gonna be 120 volts, but I could have that over here. That way I could start showing students how it matches the schematic quite closely. Um, but I could have that here while I could also rub some wires over here to my transformer. Uh, the transformer is hard mounted. Uh, I have had my transformers actually go ahead and clip onto the DIN rail before. It's just a pain in the butt. They're so heavy and they constantly are like falling off of the DIN rail. But, and as you're screwing in the wires and stuff like that, they're always breaking. So I got ahead, I went ahead and I mounted my uh, contactors here. Like I said, I just wanted to have that power circuit or the high voltage side of my schematic. I wanted it to be visually represented in a, in a different way to hopefully help students. Um, and then I went ahead and mounted a motor. I feel like that is the most confusing part about teaching motor controls is that there isn't actually a motor that gets turned, that gets turned on in a lot of classes or a lot of videos. So I wanted to just put a, a motor here so that way I could have a visual representation that there's a motor and it was spinning. Now, I'm sure a bunch of you guys are freaking out because it's a 120 volt motor. So if I ever do a reversing circuit on this board, I will not be able to uh, actually change the rotation of the motor, even though I do swap some wires like, you know, you know, like, like a 480 volt motor would do. So, but because it's just a visual representation. Um, so I have that. Again, if you don't want to put a motor on there, most electrical trainers for PLCs and uh, motor controls will not have a motor on them. But I just like that idea. Now, one thing that I, I kind of haven't pointed out is that I have a trainer that is in the vertical orientation. If you wanted to build them so they lay flat, there's nothing wrong with that. You could you honestly just take a piece of plywood and start mounting your stuff down. The reason I do vertical ones is because one, it's easier for the camera. Two, if I wanted to, I could mount a trainer on both sides. That way I've got the same footprint. So if I had a small classroom, I could actually have two students working in basically the same amount of space. Um, and three, stacking. So a lot of times if you have trainers that can stack on top of each other, they will get stacked on top of each other and parts will get broken and you'll be actually fixing them. So if they sit up straight up and down, typically things stay nicer. Um, and they do take more space to store though. But moving on, the actual DIN rail wire runway section is actually pretty large on this one. The reason I did that is because I wanted to have as much space here as possible so that if I ever wanted to teach maybe VFDs or if I wanted to get into motion controls with my PLCs, I had some space to start putting that stuff. As, as you start getting into those types of uh, componentry, they start taking up a lot of space. Yes, I could put my VFD over here, but I just wanted, I just wanted to have space. Um, I went ahead and bought some runway that is one inch wide by two inch tall. I just wanted to make sure there was as much board space as possible while having space to put my wire in there. Like I said, there's multiple different styles of trainers out there. Um, this is just the way I build mine. I built probably 40 trainers like this so far. I built them out of aluminum. I built them out of plywood. I built them this one out of steel. Um, and this is just a style that I like. So if you're a teacher or somebody out there trying to put something together, hopefully this helps you and starts giving you some ideas. If you have some questions or have something you want to know about, please write me a comment uh, or send me an email. Love to talk about it. And in a later video, I will probably go over most of the componentry. So if you have some questions on what kind of relays or what transformers I buy and stuff like that, I will have that listed out probably in a different video. But that's all I have for this video. Hope this helps somebody.